uh, get started since it's noon. Okay. Hi, everyone. This is Sarah from the California WIC Association, and thanks for joining us today um, to learn more about the California lactation accommodation laws that are very important and protect breastfeeding women in the workplace. Um, before I turn it over to our presenters, I'm just going to go over a couple housekeeping things. So uh, all participants are muted to ensure that we have as little background noise as possible, especially this is a fairly large webinar. Um, if you have questions, please type them into the question box and we'll get to them at the end of the webinar. Uh, to get your continuing ed units, you have to attend the whole webinar. So using the registration link you received in your email because that's the only way we can verify your attendance and you must complete the survey that you will receive in your post webinar email tomorrow. And uh, the webinar is being recorded, so you'll also receive a link to the recording in your post-webinar email as well. I am going to go ahead now and turn it over to Linda so she can talk a little bit more about what we're going to learn today and make some introductions. Okay. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Linda Cowling, and I work for the California Department of Public Health. Uh, nutrition Education and Obesity Prevention Branch. I'd like to welcome you and thank you for, to, for, for participating in today's webinar. So for the past five years, I have worked on a CDC-funded grant and along with our partners from the California WIC Association, the California Breastfeeding Coalition, the Maternal Child and Adolescent Health, Breastfeed LA, WIC and others, we have worked on ways to support breastfeeding mothers as many of you are doing as well. So we have also met with the Department of Labor, the Labor Commissioner, and other key partners and players to bring clarity on the lactation accommodation laws. So this webinar is a result of our collaboration, and we will be considering doing more of these webinars in the future. So today's webinar will provide you with valuable information and tools on ways you can support your breastfeeding moms in your community. So before I introduce today's speaker, um, I would like to share with you a document that you see on your screen um, that was de developed by my colleagues within the California Department of Public Health, Maternal Child and Adolescent Health um, Division. So the, the main takeaway from this is I think everyone understands the importance of breastfeeding, the importance that breastfeeding plays on moms and babies. Um, and we all know that the Surgeon General has called on all sectors of the communities to, to figure out ways of supporting breastfeeding moms. When, when moms have been interviewed, most of them say they really want to breastfeed, and two out of three mothers will return to work. So we really need to look at ways of how do we support our mothers in breastfeeding when they return to work. Um, it, it's unfortunate, but not all working moms have equal access to workplace breastfeeding support. Really only about 52% say that they do have support. And it's really based on the income of that mother. If a mother is at, at or below the poverty level, there's only like 32% that has breastfeeding support at her workplace. If she is four times above the poverty level, then that increases to 72%. So as you can see, if you're at the lower end of the economic strata, um, you have less support in breastfeeding at where you work. So today's speaker, um, are, are well versed in the issues surrounding lactation accommodation and they're really going to talk about some of the issues um, that our moms face when they're at work. So today's three speakers um, again are, are well versed in this issue. Our first speaker is Genevieve Thomas Colvin and she will provide an overview of the lactation accommodation laws. Robbie Gonzalez Dow is our second speaker and she will share tools and resources on lactation accommodation. And our third speaker is Katie Walters Smith, and she will provide information on how to respond to lactation accommodation questions and complaints. So before I turn it over to you, I want to read you a little bit more about our speakers. So our first speaker again is Genevieve, and she is a regional breastfeeding liaison for Northeast Valley Health Center WIC program, serving the San Fernando and Santa Clarita Valley. Previously, she was the program manager for Breastfeed LA, where she provided technical assistance to hospitals on the baby-friendly hospital designation and to employers and employees on strategies for combining work, 
and breastfeeding through policy implementation. Prior, prior to working for Breastfeed LA, Genevieve worked in the film industry as a music consultant on over 20 major motion pictures. She also produced a feature length documentary, which focuses on America's cultural obsession with breasts. She has a degree in music from California State University Northridge with an emphasis in music therapy and is an internationally board certified lactation consultant. Genevieve is also the mother of three breastfed children, Tyler, Cora, and Sadie. So our second speaker, Robbie, is the executive director for the California Breastfeeding Coalition and is the regional breastfeeding liaison for the Community Bridges WIC program in Santa Cruz County. She's a passionate advocate working at the state and local levels to remove barriers to breastfeeding so that mothers can fulfill their breastfeeding goals. Robbie is a fellow of the Women's Foundation of California Women's Policy Institute. She received her Bachelor's of Science from California State University Fresno and her Master's in Public Health from UC Berkeley. And our third speaker, Katie, is an international board certified lactation consultant and a LAMA certified childbirth educator. She provides breastfeeding support and prenatal education to new families at Good Samaritan Hospital in Los Angeles. She teaches newborn care classes at the family room in San Marino and is the advocacy committee chair for Breastfeed LA. She believes that all families all families have the right to receive the support they need to achieve their breastfeeding goals. She has a breastfeed, uh, bachelor's degree in public policy and analysis from Pomona College in California. So I will then now turn this over to Genevieve. Hi, good morning. I'm just um, waiting to be, oh, there we are. I'm going to show my screen and um, can I get the thumbs up that everybody can see my screen okay? We can Looks see like it. I can see it. Great, thank you. It's a delight to be here today. I've loved um, talking about California's amazing lactation accommodation law. I'm going to uh, click on this, Let's see. Um, begin with a quick overview and give a national context of how our lactation accommodation law is developed. We'll talk first about federal and then about state laws. Um, and then we're going to talk a little bit about um, some research around our laws and then as well as paid family leave and the role that um, California's paid family leave um, plays. And then I'll be passing the baton over to Robbie to talk about tools and resources. So I want to just back up and while most people know that California do have lactation accommodation laws, um, the, the role of uh, workplace lactation accommodation laws were really uh, improved and highlighted when in 2010 the Affordable Care Act was passed. And it included a federal lactation accommodation law. Um, at the same time, the First Lady of the United States issued a White House report on childhood obesity in which breastfeeding is highlighted as a, a re key recommendation for decreasing childhood obesity. And then we also had in 2011 the Surgeon General's call to action to support breastfeeding, which includes a specific action item to support workplace lactation accommodation. And then the 2020 Healthy People Goals also have goals around increasing the number of employers who provide lactation accommodation support. And all of these things in combination have really helped to highlight the role that women play in the workforce and the fact that when they become mothers that they need accommodations. And let's begin also with the breastfeeding recommendations. The reason why having lactation accommodations is so critical is actually to be able to meet the thing that all healthcare organizations recommend, which is exclusive breastfeeding for the first six months. With most women returning to work often before six weeks, it's really critical that as in that critical period of time when they're developing their milk supply and trying to maintain their milk supply that they have an accommodation where they can pump their breast milk and the time to be able to do it. So let's start with the federal law. In 2010, the break time for nursing mothers law was passed through the Affordable Care Act. It's a law that amends the Fair Labor Standards Act of 1938. This is the law that brought us um, lots of important workplace protections like ending child um, employment um, and, and overtime pay for people and an hourly wage. Um, they also um, 
uh, oversee our Family Medical Leave Act, the Department of Labor. And this law um, makes sure that people who are um, at the most risk of being exploited have basic employment rights. This law calls for reasonable accommodations and it requires employers to provide as many breaks as a mother needs to be able to accommodate her, her lactation. It also requires employers to provide appropriate space. There is a limit in that it's only applicable for the first year of a baby's life, but there's a very important preemption clause. And that preemption clause states that if there is a state law that has a greater protection, then the state law would prevail. So how does that compare with the California law? Well, the first thing is, is that the federal law doesn't preempt the California law if the California law provides greater protections. And in some cases, the California law does provide greater protections. So the, between the California and the federal law, both of them apply to all employers and employees. Frequently we hear, excuse me, for all employers, but not all employees. So in California, the California law does apply to all employers and all employees, but the federal law only applies to non-exempt employees. These are employees who are categorized as hourly um, and not exempt from overtime pay. So generally we know those to be the people who are sometimes called covered employees or hourly employees. Now, <clears throat> Some employers think that the federal law doesn't apply to them because some employers who have less than 50 employees may be exempt if compliance would create an undue hardship. However, the federal law has been really clear that a federal hardship would be hard to actually um, meet the criteria because there are so many options for how to accommodate an employee. So in general, the, the Department of Labor has advised us that most employees need to comply first and then ask for a hardship, um, an undue hardship exemption. So again, an employer can't flat out deny based on the size of their um, organization. They need to accommodate first and then apply for the undue hardship exemption. In California, however, employers can claim an undue hardship, but there's less criteria around how to go about that. As for how long the law applies to the lactating woman, in California, it says that a reasonable amount of break time, but there's no upper age limit, meaning that there is no, it says just for the infant. It doesn't say the infant that is one year old or the infant that is two years old. So because there is no upper age limit, a mother is eligible to take breaks under California law for as long as she needs it. Under federal law, those reasonable breaks are limited to the first year. And under California law and federal law, they may use any already break, uh, scheduled break times that they already have, as well as additional unpaid breaks um, if they're not concurrent with their paid breaks. The important thing to know is that outside of the state of California, most rest and meal periods are unpaid. In California, um, under certain work orders, most hourly employees are entitled to a 10-minute paid break in the first four hours of their shift and in the second four hours of their shift, plus a 30-minute unpaid break. The important aspect about the, the breaks is that they are a net break, meaning you cannot calculate the time that it takes to get to the designated space, whether they're a lactating employee or not. The key here is that the location of the space must be in close proximity, and there's no legal definition of what that means. But if you ask an employee to walk, say, 15 minutes to get to the designated space, the 15 minutes it takes cannot be calculated against the mother's time. It is the time that she's inside the designated space that becomes the actual break time. And later, Robbie will show us um, how to identify the exact area on the Department of, excuse me, the Division of Labor Standards Enforcement's website, so you can see exactly where it says that. <clears throat> So for most employees, they'll have a 10 minute paid break, but they'll probably still need another 10 minutes of unpaid. And how the employer handles that is um, based on their timekeeping system. Some employees have found that it's useful for them to come in an extra 10 minutes early or stay an extra 10 minutes late to make up so that they don't actually lose any additional income. As for space, there are some slight differences between the federal and the California law, 
but essentially they are the same in that they need to provide a room or another location in close proximity to the work area, and it cannot be a toilet stall for the California law. And under federal law, it's a little bit more detailed. It needs to be shielded from view and free from intrusion from coworkers and the public, and it cannot be a bathroom. So the federal law has stronger protection when it comes to the appropriate space. But the most important part of both of these particular um, laws is that they each come with a civil penalty or a civil sanction, meaning that employers who fail to provide accommodations to their lactating employees can have to pay a penalty. In California, it's a civil penalty of $100 per violation. So if an employer fails to provide a lactation accommodation three times in one day, that would be approximately $300, which is generally more than that employee is probably making and, and how much you would actually be spending if you were just to pay them for their breaks. And it's estimated under federal law that it could be up to $1,100 per violation for willful violations. There are many other important California laws that apply and support this lactation accommodation law. For example, the Civil Code 43.3 to be able to breastfeed in public, the Civil Procedure Code Section 210.5 jury duty exemption. A key piece to know about this is that um, this jury duty exemption applies to mothers who are in the primary care of their infants in breastfeeding. And so mothers who are have returned to work frequently find that they are not actually exempt from jury duty because their employer will pay for ju jury duty and they're already separated from their infant with child care. So um, it's important to know that if an um, employed mother is called for jury duty and she is um, separated from her baby and has lactation accommodations at work, she needs to request lactation accommodations when she goes to the courthouse. And there are some um, laws that help protect mothers in those situations, which I'll cover just shortly. Here is Labor Code 30, uh, 1030, which is reasonable accommodations for lactation in the workplace. And I always like to mention Labor Code 1171.5, which is California's labor code that states that labor laws are enforced regardless of immigration status. So for mothers who um, may be here and, and their immigration status is not, um, uh, their immigration status is still pending, they still have a right to a lactation accommodation and the same kind of workplace protections that other employees have. In California, we have a really important um, law called the Fair Employment and Housing Act, F-E-H-A. It's a, a key civil rights law and there's specific pregnancy regulations and within those pregnancy regulations, they specifically state that lactation is another related medical condition that requires reasonable accommodations. And most employers have to post either their notice A or their notice B, and I, both of them talk about lactation accommodations. We also have case law that really states how important breastfeeding is. The Department of Fair Employment and Housing versus Acasas Tacos is a case that states that breastfeeding is an act intrinsic to being female. This is a case of a woman, a monolingual Spanish-speaking mother who gave birth to a preterm infant. She had worked for a long time at this um, taco, this taqueria, and when she asked to come back to work, they told her they'd given her job away. And then they called her that night and said, can you do a swing shift anyway? So she showed up to work and her husband brought her preterm baby and she breastfed her baby in the parking lot. And when they discovered that she was breastfeeding her baby in the parking lot during her break, they fired her for breastfeeding. And so this law states that you cannot act, you cannot um, terminate or dis, uh, discriminate or harass a mother based on breastfeeding because it's an act intrinsic to being female. Um, but that law only applied, that case law only applied to cases that were brought in front of the Department of Fair Employment and Housing, and it didn't apply to all um, cases in the state of California. So the California legislature passed AB 2386, which changed to the Fair Employment and Housing Act to say that women, breastfeeding women are a protected class in the same way that there are 17 other protected classes like race and ethnicity and gender identity and DNA and genetic identity. Um, all of those different protected classes are protected under the Fair Employment and Housing Act. And all of these laws together has made California a leader amongst um, employ employment law it, we actually have the greatest legal protections for breastfeeding women. So we're gonna pause for just a moment now and I'm gonna ask Sarah to go ahead and put a polling question up for me. And I'm gonna just check to see if that's coming. And we're gonna do a quick poll. 
and the poll is open. I don't, I'm not able to see the poll, um, but if somebody could let me know that the poll is going, this is the question. So the poll should be open um, so people can go ahead and vote. And so right now we're at about 27% uh, of respondents have voted, so I'll leave it open for another 30 seconds or so so everyone can vote, and then I'll share the results. I'm excited to see your response to this question. So we're having a little bit of dead space right now, so I'll just say again, it's really good to be in California with our strong uh, commitment to women. How are we doing, Sarah, on the polling? We are at 79% of people have voted, so I'm just going to give it maybe three more seconds, and then I'm going to go ahead and close it. <laughs> Excellent. Okay, it looks like we've got a polling result. So, Sarah, what's the, the question, and what were the polling results? So the question is, uh, breastfeeding rates are affected the most by which part of lactation accommodation law? And 27% of respondents said reasonable space accommodation, 1% said access to hospital grade pumps, 11% said enforcement, so penalties and fines, and 61% said reasonable break time accommodation. Oh, that's wonderful. Thank you so much for that poll. So I'm gonna t share a little bit of research now. Um, on, on the role of public policy. And this is a piece of research that was um, published in the uh, Maternal and Child Health Journal. And in this, uh, it's called The Association of State Law on Breastfeeding Practices in the United States. And the purpose of the study was to examine the relationship between breastfeeding initiation and duration practices with selected laws enacted at the state level in a nationally representative population. So what they used was the 2003-2010 National Health and Nutrition Examination Surveys to examine the breastfeeding practices. And this is a survey that, that's um, uh, administered every two years to approximately 6,000 participants in age. And as you can see from the slides here, they examined several different laws. They looked at breastfeeding in any public location, a public accommodation for breastfeeding. They looked at laws that exempted breastfeeding from indecency, which is a really important thing that we're going to talk about in a minute on how we talk about breastfeeding, whether breastfeeding is indecent or a medical benefit. And workplace break time to breastfeed and workplace private area to pump that's other than a toilet stall, jury duty exemptions, breastfeeding awareness campaigns, these are like public health campaigns, and then enforcement of breastfeeding in public and enforcement of breastfeeding in laws. And when you see enforcement of breastfeeding in public and public laws, uh, pumping laws, I panicked a little bit because California isn't listed here on either side. And I know that since 2002, we have had a law with an enforcement provision. So I contacted the researcher and sure enough, the journal had misprinted the map. So if you ever pull this research for yourself, make sure you get a copy of the correct map. And this is it. This is the correct map that shows that California is on there. From 2003 to 2010, we had a lactation accommodation law that includes enforcement. So what were the odds of breastfeeding taking place based on these laws? So for infants, the, end, the odds of a baby having any breastfeeding increased by 43% for a public accommodation law, 81% for jury duty exemption, and it increased by 225%. This one was by far the most important one if there was an enforcement for pumping at work law, and it decreased by 26% if breastfeeding was exempted um, from an indecency law. And then because we care about how long women breastfeed, I wanted to see what happened at six months. So the research showed that infants, the laws of an infant's breast, breastfeeding at six months, it increased by 34% if there was a private location at work to pump, 66% for jury duty exemption, but 102% for enforcement. So what it really tells me, oh, and also reduce the, the, the odds of a baby being breastfed at six months from um, if they exempted breastfeeding from indecency laws. And so what this research really highlights is that employers are more likely to actually provide um, employees with lactation accommodations if they're at risk of being fined. And this is a really important piece to communicate to mothers. 
because a lot of mothers lack the self-efficacy to be able to stand up for themselves. So the more that we can ex um, tell them and explain to them how to complain and how to make sure that they are accommodated in the workplace to actually make the complaints. One of the first things that we did when we um, engaged the uh, Department of Industrial Relations Division of Labor Standards Enforcement, which is the California Labor Commissioner, was asked them how many complaints that they got regarding lactation accommodations. And there just isn't very many because people don't take the time to complain. And if we don't complain, then we don't count. So it's really important. Enforcement for pumping at work is a really critical, critical piece of our lactation accommodation law. I want to talk about the lowest wage workers, and those are the ones that are in welfare um, in people who are employed through welfare at work requirements. And so in uh, a few years ago, a law was passed, SB 252. It changed the welfare to work requirements saying that pregnant women can satisfy the requirements by participating in a public health home visitation program like the Nurse Family Partnership. It also, this law reinforced public accommodations for breastfeeding, but it really raised a question of what happens when they're engaged in the welfare to work um, activities, which often requires them to go to um, serve volunteer hours or go to community colleges, and, and are they um, have, do they have a right to a lactation accommodation? So we asked, and, and the question came up is, are CalWORKs participants considered employees or are they considered participants? So um, initially, the Department of Social Services told us that no, that they did not have a right to a lactation accommodations, but we actually asked the California Labor Commissioner, and they assured us that yes, they would have a right to a meal and rest periods in the same way that any other employee would. So if you ever have anybody in the CalWORKs program um, who needs lactation accommodations, they also have a right. And paid family leave is a really critical law that we have in the state of California. We're one of only four states that offers a law. And what this research shows is that it, it doubled the median duration of breastfeeding for all new mothers that used it, even low-income mothers. So California has had a paid family law as long as we've had a lactation accommodation law, since 2002. But most people still don't know that they have a right to be able to have income replacement when they take a leave after their baby is born. Many do know that they might have a right to disability income for pregnancy, but there's an additional six weeks of paid family leave that they can take. So this is the way that looks through the California um, Pregnancy Disability Regulations. It says that under the, this is all just income replacement, not job protection. Under income replacement laws, a mother has a right to four weeks before she gives birth and she will receive a percentage of her uh, income through the state disability insurance plan. After she gives birth, she's eligible for six weeks or more, depending on how disabled she is from um, recovering from her childbirth. And then she's eligible for an additional six weeks of bonding paid leave through the California Paid Family Leave Act. And then the father could take an additional six weeks because dads are also eligible to take paid family leave if they've paid into the state disability insurance fund. The most important thing I need to, to point out here is that disability is determined by the patient's physician and not the state. If the doctor um, has any concerns about the mother's health, um, for example, if the mother is suffering from postpartum depression, for example, that is a disabling condition that would be covered. So it is, again, the doctor's um, ability to determine the length of disability. This is key because so long as a mother is um, out on pregnancy disability leave, she has greater job protection. And right now we don't have a law that protects all people uh, for taking their paid family leave from losing their jobs. This is an important uh, source resource, which I know will be shown later, but it explains all of the different laws and their interactions with each other because pregnancy disability leave laws and income replacement laws and family medical leave, which are job protection laws, all of those things support whether or not a mother is successful at breastfeeding. This is my email address, and um, my, my recommendation is that you have a regional breastfeeding liaison through the WIC program in your area. Partner with them, contact your local WIC agency, find out who the regional breastfeeding liaison is. They have this presentation and are happy to come out and do support um, presentations to employers in your community and you're always welcome to email me. And now I'm gonna pass the baton to Robbie, who's gonna talk about resources that will support this information. Thank you, Genevieve. Thank you for that fantastic summary of the laws and how public policy matters. I'm going to show my screen. 
And Sarah, if you can bring up the first poll. I have two polls to start with. Is it there? Oh, there. Yes. So the first is, um, if you agree with this, say yes. So I know where to find the website resources with information about the state and federal lactation accommodation laws. Kind of, or no? How's the response so far, Sarah? About 70% of people have voted, so I'll give it a couple more seconds before I close it. Okay, so I'm sharing the poll results, and 46% of people said yes, 44% of people said kind of, and 10% of people said no. Okay, well today you're going to find out where they are, and then the other poll, I just have one more. Okay. So just yes or no, and it will say, I have read the frequently asked questions about lactation accommodation on the California Department of Industrial Relations. Labor Commissioner's website. And that's up, Sarah? Yep, and about 70% of people have voted on that. So again, I'll leave it up for a couple more seconds and then I'll close it. There really is a lot of information out there, and I was almost thinking that, um, you know, this kind of information overload. So I'll show you where those resources are in a summary of each one. How is it going, Sarah? I'm closing it right now, and I will share that. So. 11% um, said that they have read it, and 89% said that they have not. Okay, then this will be very useful for you today. And are you seeing my screen? Yes. Okay. So, um, first of all, all the resources are on the California Breastfeeding Coalition website. When you go to the tab Breastfeeding Rights, in work and school place, workplace and school, and this may change. I think we're going to separate workplace and school. But on this page, when you scroll down, all the resources are here that I'm going to show you today. And even when you scroll down a little bit further, um, they're they're just listed here also. So um, don't worry, you will be able to find them. So the first one I'm going to go to is the Frequently Asked Questions on the California Department of Industrial Relations Labor Commissioner's website. And this is really our official guidance that we currently have from the Labor Commissioner's Office on implementation of the California Lactation Accommodation Law. And so when you scroll down, um, this first paragraph here, this first one, explains the law and you heard Genevieve explain the law and it does apply to every employer and that is a really important part of our law. The paragraph, um, also something that Genevieve mentioned is there's that hardship exemption but it's really not for the company or the business to determine. They do have to provide lactation accommodation, make a reasonable effort but then it would be up to the mom to make a complaint if she's not being accommodated. So the complaint process is very important, and I'll show you where that's at. The second paragraph um, explains how lactation 
accommodation is considered a rest period. And um, if that rest period is missed, that's another violation. So she would, if any of those rest periods um, are missed, then she would get an hour's pay. Not for each, hour, each break missed, but if the break is missed, she would get an hour of pay for that day. The third paragraph, down. Okay, I have to get rid of this pen. Okay, I didn't realize that. Uh, okay, here we go. <laughs> now you have to get rid of that pen before you can scroll down. So the third paragraph, sorry, this, that pen is uh, uh, still existing there. That's where it defines the rest period as a net 10 minutes, which means that the rest period begins when the employee reaches an area away from the work area that is appropriate for rest, or let's say lactation accommodation. And that's what Genevieve was explaining right here. That's where that language is. The rest of the page is the frequently asked question. And um, so this part is, um, Important, but I want to point out is question three. Can my employer demand a doctor's note or uh, other medical documentation? We've actually had someone call about this where um, the woman was new to California and she hadn't established care yet in her, and she, so she wasn't really aware of what our laws were here in California. She missed the days of work to go establish care, get a note, and she called. Um, the California Breastfeeding Coalition because she felt like, I don't think this is, she wasn't sure if it was right. She wanted to find out if there was any recourse. And so there was, she, um, a claim was made and she even got paid for that day's work, but the employer cannot require you to submit documentation regarding your need to express breast milk at work. Also, um, down question five, I'll scroll down, scroll down because this is about where um, they encourage you to make a complaint if you are not being accommodated or if you feel like you have not been given adequate time or a place to express breast milk. And I will go to that. So this is the part, if you click on that link, it takes you to how to report a labor violation law because it is a labor violation law for rest and for rest time. And when you scroll down, um, it tells you to submit it online. You can download it. You can take it to your local office. If you click on this labor commissioner's offices, you're going to get a list of the offices throughout the state. And I called yesterday to my local area, and I was 15th in line. So it might be best to take it down to the office, but um, maybe try calling your local office and you could ask them what would happen, the procedure there in that office. Again, Genevieve mentioned that all California workers are protected by the labor laws, and it states it very clear here at the bottom, so they will not question immigration status. So I think that's a really important part. The other part um, that I want to go to is, um, oh, the other part on here, can you see this, I'm moving a little far there, retaliation. So if you click here, if a mom feels that she's being retaliated, so let's say she's asking for lactation accommodation and uh, they say, well, um, today we're, or tomorrow your schedule is gonna be maybe four hours less. And she's thinking, why are they doing that? Or something's changing. And but she just feels there's some, I'm feeling like I'm being retaliated because I'm requesting lactation accommodation. Something's different. Or they're, um, they're not treating me the same as they did before. She can also make a retaliation claim. And we would encourage that. The other part. Is discrimination. So Genevieve mentioned that we have um, strong 
protections for women in California. So if she feels like she's being discriminated against in the workplace for requesting lactation accommodation, then we would also encourage her to file a complaint at the California Department of Fair Employment and Housing website. And she would just click on employment because it would be in the workplace and about employment. And when it says who's protected, it very clearly states here on the right, right, it mentions gender, sex, gender, including pregnancy, childbirth, breastfeeding, or related medical conditions. So when you scroll down, it has the procedure of how to file a complaint and the step-by-step -step process. So that, those are the state websites in the um, places where the language is, official language, and the complaint process. So we will quickly go over to uh, the department. Let's see. I brought all these links up, and now they are. OK. So for the federal law, break time for nursing mothers, this is the official page. So it's at the Department of Labor, and it's break time for nursing mothers. And there's um, a, a great overview. There's a good overview, general guidance with a fact sheet. They also have frequently asked questions that um, I would really encourage you to read those. And remember that this law applies to employees. The trigger really is do you apply for, or do you qualify for overtime or not in your workplace? And there's another document that I'll show you the link where um, a mom could look, okay, this is how I can determine which law applies to me. So they also encourage if the, if you don't, if you feel like you're not being accommodated, then to go through the complaint process. I really like how the Department of Labor has this um, this page on how to file a complaint because it clearly states the information that you need to have ready to file a complaint. There are some handy resources, a flyer if you click on the, this flyer, it's very simple basic language on how to file a complaint. It has a description of the investigative process and frequently asked questions. So this is a really good site. Um, also, you can call that 1886 number, 866 number that they have listed on this website. You can also go to the local office. At the coalition, um, we have posted up here on this page when we have all the departments. So if you want to make a complaint, here's all the departments where you can make a complaint. But I also made this video that has an enforcement agent in Sacramento explain the process and there's a mom who made a complaint she was an ambulance driver and just to demystify the process and to show how easy it can actually be and the help that you can get so we have another poll Sarah I'm wondering if you can bring that one up oh, there we go So yes or no, I have shared the online resource supporting nursing moms at work employer solutions with the business or employer. So about 50% have voted. If you don't know what it is, that's okay. You can say no. I didn't put that option. So I guess it would be a no. And we're at about 70%. I'm going to give it five more seconds. Okay. And I'm asking this question because this really is a resource for employers. Okay, so sharing the results, we got 29% of people said yes, they have shared it, and 71% said no. Okay. So I highly encourage you to share this website. And 
to go through it. Um, it. It's on the Office on Women's Health, the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, and the target. This was developed with um, employers in mind. So this is the target. This is who it's made for. And it has hundreds of photos and solutions for every type of industry. And you can search the website in two, two different ways. So you can go to the industry. And on this page, you'll see that there are 22 industries on this page. And um, I'm going to go to agriculture. And each industry page features a video, photos, ideas for space and time solutions. And I recently discovered something I want to show you. If on the top right, if you click in Espanol, the whole site changes in Spanish and all the videos are in Spanish as well. So if you, um, in your area, if you have employers who are primarily Spanish speaking, this is a great resource. A resource. I had no idea that all the videos had been translated into Spanish. And then you can just go back into English here, but the, it appears that the entire website is now in Spanish, or at least most of it. So at this page, you can also go down to, there'll be business examples. And you can click on a business example. And if it had the icon, it meant that there was um, a video. And then at that employer page, you can learn more about the solutions used by that business. And then this introductory page gives a summary of um, some solutions, photos, uh, just how they, images, and how they provide lactation accommodation and work out those space and time issues. If you go up here to the left, you can always go to the main page just by clicking on that top part. You can also search by solution. So maybe there's some um, solution that you need if it's space or time. So let's say if we went to flexible space, there's not a lot of space. This was a big, kind of a big warehouse. And what they did is they cornered off or they put this, um, Type of structure up to provide privacy. In another place, they actually cornered off a corner and put a wall. They put a wall with a door and they um, put a baby changing table in there too. So many, many ideas of solutions and um, how you can make it work. There's always options. You could also go in and get more information. So if you wanted to see the partitioned area, there's different partitioned areas, different examples. So I've seen this in the hospital, these types. I think the one um, tip and when you're talking to employers is that they involve the user. Who, who's going to use this space? Involve them in the solution because you want it to work for that mom. Sometimes they might think it's a great idea, but the mom's like, that is not going to work for me. On this left side, there's all other types of resources for moms. You can go to each site and just uh, cruise through those different sections. Many, many, many resources. I'm not going to go into each one of these just um, because of time. Um, on our website, you will also find from the USBC a guide to the right of breastfeeding employees in California. You can download this. You can make copies. But this is where I was saying that they put the different laws that we have that provide protections for mom. She can see which one applies to her. And it goes down on that left side with like, are employers required to have a policy on breastfeeding employees? Frequency of milk expression breaks, length of time, duration. So it kind of answers some of those questions that someone may have, pay requirements. The other resource that they have that's fairly new is a guide. If you scroll down this page, so this page basically has everything that the federal website had on the federal law. And when you scroll down, there's a guide. What you need to know about the break time for nursing mother's law. And that link is also on our website. And I believe 
Um, the one last tool I want to share with you is um, from Breastfeed LA. They have a new guide, Breastfeeding Advocacy 101 Toolkit. And on page 17, it has the information for breastfeeding at work. So you can download it. It's in English and Spanish. And it doesn't just have breastfeeding at work, the laws, but it has a lot of other, lots of information about um, women's rights in California, their lactation accommodation rights. And as Genevieve mentioned, there's even the uh, six key laws for working parents in California in there. So thank you. And remember, you can always go to the California Breastfeeding Coalition website to find these resources under the Breastfeeding Rights tab. And so I'll pass this over to Katie now. All right, um, can everyone hear me and see my PowerPoint? We can yeah. hear you and we can see your PowerPoint. I don't think it's in that center mode. Excellent. All right, so I'm gonna dive right in to respect everyone's time. Um, I do just wanna briefly touch on um, uh, what other folks have said about our Katie, changing. you're on note yes. page. You're on your note page. You're not on 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 um, presentation. View. Okay. Um, it says that it's showing the PowerPoint on my screen. What do I need to change um, from my end? Katie, Start I think because you have it in PDF, so I think it um, slides should maybe. Slideshow play. Um, you still can't see it? We can see it. It's just in a mode where it's just small. I think. Um, but you know what? Okay. Since we're so far behind, I would just go ahead with it. Okay. Well, you all will be able to download this presentation, I think, after. And I'm, I'm sorry about that. <laughs> that um, <laughs> okay. So we um, we know that our economy is changing. Both more women um, with children under three are in the workforce um, than in previous years. That percentage has been increasing since 1975. Um, and there was a really interesting study that came out in 2016 um, that showed that low-wage women's jobs are actually growing at a faster rate than other jobs in our economy. Um, they defined uh, low-wage women's jobs as jobs where most of the workers were female, and the median wage is 15, less than $15 an hour, um, and they're fairly large occupations. So what does this mean for us? It means that lactation, uh, access to lactation accommodations are critical to breastfeeding success, um, that parents may be basing their decision on whether or not they're gonna brace, um, breastfeed based on their knowledge of or lack of knowledge about lactation accommodations at work, um, and that they may be working in industries where they're increasingly likely to face barriers to lactation accommodation. Um, some of those barriers include lack of information, um, fear of negative consequences of speaking up at work, um, any pre-existing challenges in the work environment. So if a mom is already having a hard time getting her rest breaks, she may also have a hard time um, enforcing her right for lactation accommodations, and people may not know where to go if they have trouble enforcing those accommodations. Um, however, Katie, all workers... Katie, yes. Can I ask you, are you still on that first slide that says Breastfeeding Advocacy 101? No, I've gone through. Okay, because that's what we're seeing. Okay. There you um, go. Okay. Can, can you... Like <laughs> So, yeah, I can see the change. Would you? Would it be easier if I uh, switched it to my screen and I can show your slides? On the bottom, on the left, on the very bottom, that one. Oh wait, that here one. we go. How about this? Yes. Yes. Is that? Can you see the page? No. It's it's still it's off. Not. Click it again. Oh well. Just go to slideshow in the top tab. See the way it says tab? Go to slideshow. Click the tab that says slideshow. Now you have to actually click it. The tab. No, the tab. Up top. Yeah, the tab. Uh, it's right next to 
Uh-huh. See where it says slideshow? Coming over oh. to the left. You have to use the cursor and click on slideshow. I'm, I'm it goes um, file tools, charts, smart art, transitions, animation, slideshow. If you click on slideshow, yeah. it's the word. Bring, over to bring the your cursor over a little bit to the right. Keep coming Keep over the right. to the right. Bring cursor to the right. Ah, okay. Sorry, yeah. sorry, sorry. It's a okay. from current slide. There you go. Is that working? Try it again. Okay, then come down this. and then try. No, this is not highlighted. Oh well. Is is a is can you go come down to the bottom left? Come down to the bottom okay. left. All the way down. I tried that okay. already. Yeah. Oh, I thought that maybe it yeah. might come on. I yeah, would just just keep just, just, keep, just keep keep clicking the slides when you're on them on the left. From there. Okay, I see here. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Okay. All right, so um, where was I? I was here. All workers in California have the same rights. Um, so you are already an advocate. Your work supporting breastfeeding families is already having an impact. And because you're in conversation with new breastfeeding families, you have a great opportunity to share this information. Um, so when you're doing that, you want to just use the counseling skills you already have. So believe that the person has the capacity to advocate for themselves, um, listen to what they're telling you, provide information support, and then support their informed decision. Um, one thing I would add for lactation accommodations is that you do want to encourage everything that they're doing, um, so both the request and then anything that the employer says. Um, so what if you don't know the answer? What if it's a complicated case? So that's when you want to refer to other people and resources. So any of the resources that Robbie listed, um, your local breastfeeding liaison, um, the California Breastfeeding Coalition, or Breastfeed LA, and other coalitions. So moving along to practical things that you all can do to incorporate this information um, in serving your populations is one, to include it in prenatal education. This is something that I've done in my classes and people are really responsive. Um, the three categories that I would suggest doing that are um, including information about paid family leave, about lactation accommodations at work, and about public breastfeeding accommodation laws. And then what happens when you are face-to-face -face with someone who's running into an issue? Sometimes it's pretty straightforward. Um, an employee may just need to remind their employer that they have a right to accommodations, and that's all it takes. And that is something that you can do, right? So if they come to you, they say, you know, I'm having trouble getting pumping at work, and then you say, actually, you have the right to do that. Let's talk about how you would talk to your employer. That may be all it takes. Um, we did have an um, example recently where this happened. Um, I'm just going to share one of these stories. So a woman um, contacted Breastfeed LA after she was told um, that she would not be able to pump um, at a gig that she was playing at at a concert venue. Um, she contacted Breastfeed LA. The Breastfeed Breast LA said, that doesn't sound right. Why don't you call the venue and see if they actually have accommodations? She did that, and then she was able to both play the gig and um, win those accommodations. So it was just a matter of getting on the phone with the right person. Um, however, we know that a lot of times it's not that straightforward, right? Um, the parent may have to advocate for themselves, they may have to document extensively, um, they may need legal support, community support, um, and they may be ready to continue advocating for a long time. And not everyone is gonna decide to do this, um, but the people who do can have an impact far beyond their individual um, case, and as Genevieve was mentioning, some of our case law is based on mothers who decided to do this. Um, so Breastfeed LA is involved with two cases at the moment that kind of fit into that second category, um, and I'm just going to highlight one of them. So a Los Angeles teacher um, was denied the right to breastfeed her daughter on her lunch break. Um, Breastfeed LA has been supporting her for many months as she's working um, on resolving her own personal issue. Um, it's still not resolved, but she herself has now become a breastfeeding advocate and is teaching other teachers how to um, 
access their own uh, lactation rights at work. And she went up with us to Sacramento to advocate for the new paid family leave bill. Um, so I'm going to end with just my final thoughts are that advocacy begins with you. Um, you never know if the person that you're educating or that you connect um, to your local breastfeeding coalition or liaison will become the next leader in our um, movement for breastfeeding rights. Um, and I have some references. And if you would like to join Breastfeed LA's advocacy committee, um, please send us an email. Um, we'd love to work with you. Okay, thank you, Katie. Um, so now would be the time to ask your questions. We have a couple of them. Uh, one is the handout about parent leave rights available in Spanish, and how can we obtain a bunch to distribute? I can actually answer that. Um, this is Katie. Um, it is available in Spanish. Are you talking about the legal aid at work hand handout? Uh, I'm not exactly sure which one um, she was referring to. Okay, but well, the Legal Aid at Work handout is available in Spanish, Vietnamese, and Tagalog, um, and it's available for download off their website. And that's one website I didn't show, um, because you may need more help in whatever the issue is, and so Legal Aid at Work is a great resource. And um, they're listed on our website under the resources to make breastfeeding and work possible on, in the, on the California Breastfeeding Coalition website. And so if you feel like this is really going beyond what I know or this person, this is really a legal question, then I would direct them to there. They have a fantastic 1-800 number, a helpline um, in California. I believe it's a 41, but it's 415, but it's toll free. And they have lots of fact sheets there that are in several languages. Um, someone, oh, she's supposed to write the handout that showed the various types of leave for California breastfeeding moms. I'm not sure if that's the same. That's, Is that in your presentation, Genevieve? No, it's in your presentation. It's the, um, oh, the various types of leaves. I'm sorry. So that's the six key laws. Um, and if you want to um, pop back and show my screen, I'm happy to show that, um, show that for you. Um, if, so and, I'm gonna and also, is this coming ahead. up Legal Aid at Work? Um, they have it also on their website. And you can just Google. Um, I'm going to just. I hope my cursor is showing here. I'm circling California Work and Family. Because um, if you go to um, the California Work and Family right here, I'm trying to practicing my arrows here. Um, and if you go to their website, which is workfamilyca.org. Um, if you Google workfamilyca.org and six key laws for parents, this comes up in Spanish and English. And it's a, uh, we print these out and put these in our WIC, we have these in our WIC clinic in our breastfeeding um, classrooms. And every uh, breastfeeding assessment that I do when I have it, see a baby at one or two weeks, I ask them, are you getting your pregnancy disability leave? Do you have a plan for your to use your paid family leave? Do you know what it means? And pre, I, not, I have not yet had one parent who understood what their rights were. So I encourage people to print these out and put them up um, in your clinics. Uh, someone asked, so lactation accommodations includes not only pumping, but also bringing babies to breastfeed? So this is Genevieve, and I can answer that question. And the answer is actually no. It only accommodates um, the needs of the mother, the lactating mother. So, um, however, um, as I mentioned, the hourly employee is free to leave at any time during their meal break, the 30 minutes that they have between their first four-hour shift and their second four-hour shift. And if they are free to leave, they are free to breastfeed in any public location where they are, are authorized to be. So this is really important for mothers who are returning to work because um, let's say they work at a McDonald's or they work even at a hospital or in a clinic. Um, the initial going back to work can be troublesome and, and difficult on women's milk supplies. So if somebody can bring their baby to them at lunchtime when they are on an unpaid break and they are free to leave, then um, 
then uh, they can breastfeed their baby in any place where they're publicly allowed to be. The key here is that if the employer restricts them from leaving, then they're obligated to pay them. So if the employer says you cannot leave um, at your lunch break, you have to stay in this designated space, then they are obligated to pay them for that time. Um, someone's asking, can you show the first brochure back on the screen? That's the one I want to order for our family. It's actually, I uploaded it in as a PDF form in your handout. So if you look in your handouts, I'm assuming you're talking about the one that was shown on screen when Linda was doing introductions. That's available as a handout and you can download it. Sarah, can you, yeah. um, can I show my screen quickly? Yes. Yeah. While you're reading the questions. I just wanted to show the Legal Aid at Work website that I have up here. And when you scroll down, this is their working family page and we have a direct link to it. And this is where the, uh, the help line numbers are. And then they have videos and these are all in different languages. If you just go up to the top and click the, um, English, Spanish, the whole website will go into Spanish. And I believe that's Chinese. And then they have some interactive tools and then fact sheets down at the bottom. They are going to be at the California Breastfeeding Summit in January, and they're, they are going to go over um, how you may create some ordinances in your own city to fill in those gaps of lactation accommodation where you see need. They've actually improved what our current law is, but in San Francisco to make it easier for women to access lactation accommodation. Hi, hi, Sarah. This is Linda. Maybe in the interest of time, we can talk about how um, they can go about getting their CEUs, attendees can get their CEUs and evaluation. Um, I, I know yep. this is recorded, so we can, if there are additional questions, the questions and answers can be sent out with the recording. Um, but I think we just want to be mindful of the time that uh, everyone has spent. Okay. Yeah, so the CEUs will be available. Um, after the survey is completed and you will get the link to the survey tomorrow in an email which will also include the link to the recording and um, the questions i can make all of the questions available to all of the panelists via email and um, it will include who asked the question i'm not sure if there's a way to email answers to all the questions to everybody but we do have quite a few questions I'm willing to stay on if since it's recording, we could answer them. So if people need to get off, they can they can hear them. Is that okay? Sure. Yeah, that won't that won't affect people's CEUs because it, it will tell me like how many minutes you attended the webinar and um you don't have to stay later to hear the answers to the questions. You can hear them in the recording. Um that won't affect your CEUs. So I can keep going on questions. Um, someone asked, does the WIC or does the state WIC require this topic to be included in the WIC PN classes? This is Suzanne. I, I'm actually not a speaker on this call, but I, I did want to say that we are working to have more uh, interactive webinars next year on this topic so that people will feel more comfortable. Okay addressing lactation accommodation. I know many people have to get off, so I, I did want them to know that. Okay. Uh, Robbie, did you know about um, whether state WIC requires the topic to be included in um, P I'm not I, sure. I don't think, public. yeah, I don't think it's, it's specific to like a specific topic. You know, there are some WIC programs that have their own going back to work class, but not all WIC programs. Okay. Uh, do you have any info or resources on how to get breast pumps for working mothers? What provisions are in place through WIC and Medi-Cal? Okay. <laughs> it's a big this one. Is that something that, yeah, this is a big one. Um, because it can be different in each county. So it was specific to Medi-Cal. Genevieve, I don't know if you want to start in that, but it, it is different in each county if she's on Medi-Cal managed care. Are we talking about how to access breast pumps? Yeah. Okay, so the way it works is that um, 
the Affordable Care Act also changed the the um, health care landscape, and one of those things was the Women's Preventative Services called for breastfeeding support supplies and counseling, and it gave very little guidance on how that was going to be implemented. In the state of California, the money comes in at the state level um, to cover Medicaid, and then it's redistributed to the counties to, um, to um, implement Medi-Cal. And every county is slightly different, but there's three main ways. There's either a single plan system, like in the case of, I think it's Monterey County, um, or it is a county operated plan, like in the case of Santa Barbara, maybe San Diego, I can't remember, or there's a two plan system. In LA County, we are a two plan system, and the two plans are um, LA Care and HealthNet, but it's a misnomer because uh, frequently, other um, health plans are called in to help fill the gaps when t uh, to provide as much service as possible to a large population. So the medical managed care plans um, are obligated to provide lactation aids. Um, in my current research, what I'm finding in, at least in Southern California, in my area, um, the plans do not have appropriate contracts, and that's the real problem. Did that answer your question? <laughs> I think that's, that's a good one. There's a, Go ahead, Robbie. Also, if a mom is on WIC, then she can most likely access a pump at WIC, a loan pump, um, depending on their criteria and, and how many pumps they have. But if a mom on her card, on her insurance card, there's always a number, so I would encourage her to call that call that number and ask them. We need to have people ask for what their benefits are. And yeah, it's usually the utilization or member services. So if they call member services, they will generally get the answer. Okay, um, I'm gonna move on. Uh, from an employer point of view, what would be considered unreasonable on the part of the mother? For example, the employer suggests a few options that they are not acceptable to the employee the employee wants a particular space and this is not acceptable to the employer. Um, this is Genevieve. I've had a couple of cases like that. Um, and so one of the things is, for example, I had a case at Disneyland of a dancer who wanted to be able to pump in the break room with all of the other dancers. Um, and all the other dancers routinely would change their costumes quickly in front of each other, both male and female, and it was part of the culture of dancers at the Disneyland um, Resort. And, um, uh, but sh the mother who was pumping wanted to also just kind of face a wall and pump and not go to a, a different space. Um, the employer, Disneyland, um, said no, and they said, no, we've got it. It was literally right across the hall. It was a great office, and it was a space. The mother didn't like that accommodation because she felt like it, um, it took more time away from her, the break that she had to have to go to a different space to change. But ultimately, um, that was actually a very reasonable solution because not everybody wants to see somebody taking care of a very personal thing um, like pumping. And it also, um, employers have a responsibility to prevent discrimination and harassment and um, the potential for um, inappropriate comments by other employees in that situation. I mean, the whole thing is kind of fraught really when you think about it with problems, but that was really a, a reasonable situation. So um, there are times when I would say like in hospitals where it would, where moms sometimes request, uh, or employees sometimes request, like nursing locations that don't work out for patient care. And so while it may seem reasonable to the mother, it's not reasonable for the employer for a variety of hospital regulation reasons. Um, and that's true with breaks as well. Sometimes there are certain times when it just isn't reasonable to give a break um, in public safety situations. So for example, 911 call operators if there's a sudden um, plethora of, of incoming phone calls, it might delay the time that a mother gets a break, and that would be an undue hardship in the, in the eyes of the employer who has to provide public safety. So there are certain times when it does seem reasonable, and the most important thing I encourage both employers and employees to do is to have a plan of attack for how they're gonna handle a situation like that if they know that that's one of the conditions of their employment. So firefighters are the best example of this. Firefighters know that when they're on a long call, 
um, that it may be difficult for them to be called um, pulled out for vital checks. And so they work out with their supervisors that they might be prioritized to be pulled out of a long call for a, a priority vital check so that they can also then pump. Um, and they also know that most calls generally take 45 minutes, so they can always pump on the way back in the back of a, a truck. So I always think that it's good to give it back to the employee to think about what a reasonable solution is and to explain why it might be unreasonable for the employer. Uh, if she doesn't uh, if think it's reasonable, if she doesn't think it's reasonable, really thinks it's a problem, then you can make a complaint. That's a good point. Uh, so someone asked if a mom works part time and is receiving services through a home visitation program and CalWORK, uh, would she be eligible for a lactation accommodation at her part time job? Yes. In California, would, yes. Okay, what would exempt an employer from providing lactation accommodation? Well, no, no employer in California is exempt, um, but they could apply for an undue hardship. So uh, an undue hardship would be, for example, if um, an employee works at a 7-Eleven um, and they don't have, I mean, I don't know how this would work with rest and meal breaks anyway. There are certain home health agencies that um, in California that have different wage hour orders and even then, I can. I, I think it's pretty difficult to find an exemption. Um, they may not be fined. Is the probably the end result of a complaint? We will, we do have um, a relationship with someone at the labor commissioner's office, and they will talk to employers even before it gets to a complaint process. And it really the department doesn't want to put anything else and anything specific like this would be a hardship, this would be a hardship, because it's, they want to look at it by business by business or that situation. So it would really be for them to determine and um, you know, not for the employer to decide or for us to decide. Okay. And that was the last question. So thank you for those of you who hung in there. We actually have 66 people who are still hanging in there listening to the answered questions. But for those who left early, the, the uh, recording will be available um, tomorrow when the email goes out for CEUs. And people can expect their CEUs within a couple of weeks after they fill out the survey. Wow. Well, that, that is amazing. Thank, thank you, everyone. This is Linda Cowling. And again, on behalf of the California Department of Public Health, we truly want to thank Genevieve, Robbie, and Katie for your amazing presentation. And for those of you who still hung in there with us, um, I know this is a, a big topic and I know there's a lot of questions. So the, the PowerPoints will be, and the recording will be sent out. And I'm sure I can speak for the presenters that if you have additional questions, you can contact them directly, or you can contact your local breastfeeding coalition or your local WIC program if you have questions specifically about lactation accommodation. So again, on, on behalf of everyone, thank you all very much and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you.